Well, good morning, church. How are we doing? All right. My name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors here. We're just really glad that you're here with us. I just want to say first and foremost, go Pirates. We've got one more to go, right? We're going to do this. Horns down is what, they're, what the cool kids are saying now. Um, so glad that you're here with us. If this is your first time here, uh, we welcome you. We're really glad that you're with us, and uh, we would love to connect with you um, and get you more involved in the life here of our church. Uh, there's a connection card in front of you. You can fill that out, and there'll be a basket that will go by later on in the service. You can put it in there. If you've got any things that we can be praying for, any way we can encourage you, uh, we would love to do just that. We, um, if you've been coming for a matter of weeks now, want to know more, um, want to get more plugged in, I want to invite you to a free lunch at the end of this month, and it's on June 26th. It's called Start Starting Point, Starting Point's a way that you can uh, learn more about our church, um, how we got started, um, where we're going, maybe meet some of our leadership team, any way we can answer some of your questions. Uh, we would love to do that. And, and all you have to do is just sign up by going to our website, liveintegrity.org. You can also use the QR code in front of you. You can scan that and sign up that way. Uh, great time to meet folks, great time to get uh, just connected in the life of our church. Uh, but now it's also a great time because this morning we're starting a new series in the the book of Psalms. We're going to uh, look at different prayers uh, through the Psalms. We're going to do that all summer long. And uh, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Psalm chapter 1. That's where we'll be this morning. And to know more about this series, you can again find it on our website, every passage that we're going to choose this, this morning. We're going to kind of lay the foundation of prayer as we talk about what it means to uh, meditate on the Lord. Now, I'm going to be honest, like this uh, series is going to be a little different for us every Sunday. Um, we are kind of creatures of habits here at Integrity, and that's okay, but we want to kind of break some of those this, uh, this morning and throughout the, the weeks to come uh, in this series. And so what I'm going to do, I'll preach through uh, the Word of God every week. Uh, we'll we'll uh, tackle a different passage of Scripture that's related to prayer. Um, we have uh, different ones coming up. We have like celeb- uh, we have uh, worship, we have lament, we have all these different types of prayers that we can pray through the Psalms. And what we're going to do after I preach, um, we're going to have a chance to actually pray in the service, like for you to actually sit and ponder and meditate on God's word and, and, and pray. And so it, it's going to be a little different because normally what I do is I ask you to stand after I pray. We take communion, we give, we sit. Those are all great. We're going to continue to do those. But after I preach the word every week, uh, we'll have a chance to reflect on the psalm that I just preached. And by by actually hearing uh, a song about the psalm, and uh, then we'll sit and we'll pray and we'll ask God to, to speak to us and ask God to meet us. Uh, right where we are. And so I hope that you can engage with us in this series. The goal of this series is so that we could uh, cultivate a better culture of prayer. Um, We as a church have a mission to mature and multiply believers to leave a gospel legacy. Um, We we want to see disciples made here in Greenville. Uh, We want to see people sent out uh, for the gospel. We want to see churches planted. Uh, We want to make an impact on our community. And we can't get unless we ask. Amen? And so we have to ask. We have to ask the Lord uh, to, to meet us. We have to ask the Lord to work in us and through us. And so this is a chance that we have uh, to go through this um, together. And so we'll have a chance uh, to respond just by reflecting. Then we'll have a chance to give. We'll have a chance to take the Lord's Supper. And we'll have a chance to sing in response to the good news. Everybody tracking with that? All right, good. One person is going to follow this. Right there. It's good. Father, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you are this marvelous Savior who knows us and loves us. Thank you that you are present here with us even right now as we open up your word, as we talk to you, that we are talking to the living God, the one who is true the one who, um, as we're going to see in the text, the one who causes us to be stable like a tree planted by the waters. So God, would your word then shape us to make us more like you? Would we fall more in love with you um, through this series? Would we have such a passion to meditate on your word, to meditate on who you are, to talk to you just like you're right here with us? And so God, we believe that this morning, and we believe that through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And it's in his his name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Psalm chapter 1 is where we'll be. We'll look at verses 1 through 6. Now, I don't know about you, but 
I love survivor type reality shows like the show Survivor or Survivor Man or um, Man vs. Wild, etc. And now I know there's a lot of these shows, they are sort of overproduced. Like uh, I know that sometimes they look like they're struggling, but in reality, they probably stay at the hotel the night before and they brought the steak brought to them. We just didn't get to see that off camera. But I know that happens, but I do like to see. Uh, people really kind of like struggle to make what is around them work so that they could survive. Now, I recently stumbled upon this show that I know it's not that new, but it's a, a show that's a survivor type show called Alone. Anybody see Alone? I love that show um, because I think it takes away a lot of the overproduction. In fact, the people, uh, yes, they're going to do a background story of why the people, or the participants, want to be on the show. It's going to tell their, you know, their journey and their struggle, and then it's going to show. Obviously, the, the, the famous helicopter scene where they're helicoptered in with dramatic music and they drop them in. But what ends up happening on the show alone is that the participants are literally alone. Like there's no people around them. There's actually no camera crew around them. There's hidden cameras there uh, where they're going to set up camp. They have their own little camera they can talk to. And so the participants are actually in charge of kind of making sure uh, their section is uh, being filmed and they have to last the longest. They have other participants placed on this island. They don't even know where they are. And they don't even know how many have tapped out. And the only way to tap out is to press this little button. And then like a, a helicopter comes and picks you up and takes you away. And then that's it. The game's over for you. But the part of the show that I found really fascinating was what ended up being the hardest part for the people participating was not um, the lack of food, uh, was not the lack of shelter, was not of the threat of freezing to death. What made it difficult as they were weeks in was the fact that they were completely and utterly alone. No one to talk to, no family to see. They only had little pictures they can see. They couldn't call anybody. And it was the idea of just being completely and utterly alone. Now, I don't care if you're an introvert or an extrovert, but being alone, being completely and utterly alone can frighten us. And sometimes this gets in the way of how we talk to and communicate to God. Because what ends up happening when we feel alone, when we feel like it's just us and the Lord, we can feel really exposed, we can feel really afraid, we're driving down the road, we're heading to um, Raleigh on 264 and that lonely, boring drive. What do we need to do? We need to fill it up. We need to add up uh, sports talk radio. We need to play some music. We need to play a podcast because that feeling of alone can make us feel so exposed. If we're alone at the home, we, we, put on, uh, we put on a show. We put on a ball game. We have to fill this space. We scroll through our social media. Uh, we call a friend. We text somebody. We play a game. Whatever it is, we struggle to feel alone. We don't like that feeling. And sometimes this disconnects us uh, from the Lord because there's these beautiful spaces that we see in Scripture and the Word of God and people who love the Lord that they wanted to be alone with God. But when was the last time, honestly, when was the last time for you that you really were alone with God? That it wasn't just a time that you were just filling space. Okay, I'm going to read the passage this morning and so I can move to the next saying, okay, I'm going to pray a little bit, but I got my radio playing and I'm going to stop praying so I can look at this and say, look, there's some parts that are fine with that. God welcomes that. But listen, there's a time for us to have this um, practice, this discipline in our lives where we need to be okay being alone with God. It should be a rhythm in a discipline in our lives to, and I'm going to use the word, meditate on God. Now, I know here in the South, when we talk about meditating, it can kind of scare us. Like we think, well, that's, this is Ben with his beard, looking like a hippie. This is, he's going to talk about some hippie stuff. He's going to tell us to get alone in the woods and um, listen to tranquil music and be in this zen-like position and talk to God in some weird way. But listen, that's not what I'm trying to say. But there is a commandment, and honestly, there's a mandate from the Word of God for us to meditate on on who he is. So if it's commanded in scripture, um, we have to figure out what it is because I think it's actually essential for us to have a active, growing relationship with God. 
So I want us to start here as we go through the Psalms. Now, all the rest of the Psalms that we're going to see in this series are going to be specific prayers, but this one, chapter one, is not necessarily a prayer, but it's going to lay down the foundation of prayer, which is to meditate on God. That's what we're going to see this morning, is what it means to meditate on God. So y'all scared yet? We're good? All right, good. We'll start in chapter one. Verse one, it says this. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman. He uses the word man. He means mankind. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But listen to this. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he what? meditates day and night. And so here you see this blessed man, this blessed woman who they're blessed because they meditate. And what do they meditate on? He says they meditate on the law of the Lord. Now I want to explain uh, what this means a little bit and understand what it meant then um, when this psalm was written by King David. And then we've got to understand now, what does it mean now, uh, 600 plus years after or before Jesus came? Like, so Jesus um, came to the earth over 2,000 years ago, but now 500, 600 years before that, the psalmist wrote this song, uh, this psalm, rather, about meditating on God's law. And what he's talking about in, in his era was the Old Covenant. He's saying we're meditating on the law of Moses, God's law under the Old Testament. And so if he's saying that, now, now we have to understand then, what does he mean now uh, on this side of the cross? Now, if we read this now in uh, 2022, what does it mean to meditate on God's law? Because we have to understand that because now we're not under uh, the old covenant law. We're not under the old Testament law. For instance, the, under the old Testament law, if people had this understanding of God, like if I do this for God, then God owes me, then God will do this for me. And this is sort of a, sometimes a, a works-based understanding of God. So you even see, like the, the, it says, uh, the wicked will not prevail, but the righteous will prosper. And that's not necessarily true. Like right now, we can see people who are wicked who are prospering. And we can see people who are righteous who are suffering. So what does he mean when he says that? Well, the psalmist, because now on this side of the cross, we live under the uh, new covenant era because Jesus came, lived the life we should have lived, died the death we were condemned to die. He rose from the grave and he's now victorious and he sits on the right hand of God and he invites us into this relationship with him. And so now when we read the Psalms, we have to read it through the lenses of the gospel, what Christ has done. And so here, Under that, there's a timeless principle. There's a timeless truth uh, that remains the same under the old covenant and under the new covenant. Let me read it again. Verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits at the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on the law, he meditates day and night. He is like a, a tree planted by the streams of water and yet uh, yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. So what is he saying here? The psalmist, he's speaking about a person who loves God. And we now, on this side of the cross, we read it as a person who loves Jesus. So what does a person who loves Jesus look like? Well, he says he doesn't sit and listen to the counsel of the ungodly, that's one thing. He doesn't mock God's truth, that's the other. And he delights in God's word. So all of it's about meditating, um, keeping in the forefront of your mind God's word, God's voice. So for a believer, the primary voice in your life, according to the word of God, needs to be his word, his voice. His voice, his counsel 
is what you will choose over every other voice. So for the believer, God's authority goes above any other. And now the psalmist, he gives us insight on whether or not we actually believe that he's the authority. Because he says, if he's the authority, you will meditate on his word day and night. So if you want to know what you value and what you treasure, the psalmist says, take time to evaluate what occupies your thoughts and your heart every single day. Ralph Waldo Emerson says, a man is what he thinks about all day long. That's scary. A man is what he thinks about all day long. What do you think about all day long? Now, I don't know about you, but when it's kind of the summertime vacation for us, we go and stay at different places, and we, sometimes we go to the mountains, sometimes we go to the, um, to the ocean, to the beach, and we don't have cable. Like, as a family, um, we don't have cable. Um, we have, like, the, you know, all the sh- Netflix and Hulu and all the shows, right? But we don't have cable, so we um, watch it when we're on vacation. Like, we're staying in a hotel, we're staying in a place. They always have cable, so we're like, wow, this is what it's like, right? And so we'll turn it on, and like, I don't know, we, it will get really uh, stuck in like Food Network and HGTV. So, which means we're going to do a lot of remodels, and we're going to get really, like, gain a lot of weight. That's what that means. And so I get really stuck, like, especially these HGTV shows, like, they are unbelievable. Like, especially these couples, like, with house hunters. Like, I don't get those people. Like, who are these people? Like, they're always this young couple in their 20s with, like, a budget of $1.4 million, and they need, like, six bedrooms and eight bathrooms, and it's just them and their Labrador retriever, and they want something on the mountains that sees the ocean. It's like these unnes- un- like unbelievable expectations. And I, I always wonder, like, how do they have that kind of money? Like, it talks about his job. He's like, I'm a professional fly fisherman, and she's a French horn uh, tutor. It's like, how do you do that, right? How is this possible? I think you deal drugs. I think that's what this is, and this is a front. But I don't know about you, but I get pulled into the madness. Like, I'll see, yeah, if they could do that, and he's just a fly fisher. I, I know, we, you know, we should be able to pull off this kind. We should buy another house, or we should move to Scotland. And you kind of get wrapped up. And the craziness, or even the, the house flipping shows. It's like, honey, yeah, we can add another room, even though if it goes into our neighbor's yard, they'll be fine. Or we can add a third story, or we can extend the garage. I mean, we can make Gideon work. He's only 10, but, you know, the restaurant industry's struggling. They'll take him. You know, it's like, this will, this will be great. We can add on. And, of course, uh, I'm kind of joking, but what ends up happening is you start to meditate, and you start to, by meditating on things, it begins begins to kind of change your behavior, and then you begin to think almost like kind of irrationally. Now, you can apply that to, obviously, I'm joking here, but you can apply that to a lot of things in your life. Like, if it becomes something that you're meditating on, what ends up happening is we make decisions of things that don't really matter. Like, instead of saying, what would be good or healthy for my family? What would help us thrive As believers in Jesus, what would position us better to to further the good news of Jesus? You can apply this to so many parts of your life. Like if your mind is always occupied by overachieving uh, success, uh, maybe it's even envy, maybe it's revenge, maybe it's fear, maybe it's lust, maybe it's shame. Like if you occupy your thoughts with those things, eventually... Your emotions will take you into dark places and eventually lead you down to a path of destruction. So what is your, what's your thoughts? What occupies your thoughts? The psalmist begins. He says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. One of my biggest fears is becoming, I say it this way, the crazy man on the island. Meaning that I am lost in my own thoughts and I'm blocking any type of counsel in my life. Over the last 20 plus years that I've been in ministry, when I've seen people get 
entrenched in sin, entrenched in addiction, it's when they finally get to the point where they stop taking godly counsel. Not taking counsel begin, is the starting point to their destruction. Because what happens when they, what they begin to do is remove voices of truth in their lives. And they become lost in the pride of their own imagination. And so in some way, they become isolated on an island. And they begin to listen to themselves and, and no one else or even uh, the wicked rather than the ones who are pointing them to truth. And this is why I even believe like 2021 was so much harder for so many people than 2020 because what ends up happening is 2020 led so many people to isolation. And then what we saw in 2021 is the ramifications of the things that happened in 2020 when people stopped taking counsel. And this is why so many counselors and therapists right now are booked with their schedules because so many people are dealing with what happens when you go into isolation. Like we need people. Like, we need truth. We need counsel from others. We need counsel from the wise and from the godly, not from the foolish or the wicked. Where do you take counsel? What do you think about all day long? What do you meditate on? And if this is a struggle for you, that's okay. You're not alone. But there's good news. The psalmist presents a better way. Look in verse 3. He says, he is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and it's a leaf that does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not weak, so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. So notice here, um, and this is the difference here between the Psalms and a lot of different books, the Psalms is going to show us a lot of pictures. He says, you're like a tree, or you're like chaff. He doesn't say you are a tree, or you are chaff. Like, for instance, I remember um, my first couple years of marriage, Jess and I lived in Atlanta, Georgia. We lived like 15 minutes from Ikea, and we were a young married couple with no money, and so here we are. Uh, how do we build this house? Uh, how, how do we have a house? How do we have furniture? We started going to Ikea because it's really cheap Swedish furniture. You can put it together. It looks cool. It doesn't last but over a year, and that's about it. But I remember going, and, and when you would show up, you'd get the stuff in this box. You open it up, and because it's a Swedish company, it's worldwide, they don't have any written instructions. They're just pictures of, like, this is the way that you turn it. This is the way that you turn this little Allen wrench. And this is the way that you shouldn't turn it. And it would sometimes have a confused face. It was always the same guy that sort of like, looked like Fred Flintstone. And it sort of had these pictures. This is what you do and this is what you don't do. They didn't show a picture of a guy angry and wanting to break it and cuss because that would be more realistic. But this is what they had. But this is what kind of what it means. Like you, you would kind of see these pictures and you're trying to solve the puzzle. You're trying to figure it out. This is what the Psalms are like. The Psalms not going to tell you what to do, but it's going to give you a picture of the way that a person should live. And so read it again. He is like a tree, verse three, planted by the streams of water that yields his fruit in season and a leaf does not wither and all that he does, he prospers and the wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Now, remember, it says, when it says all he does is prosper, remember, this again is like more old covenant um, language. Sometimes even believing in God can make life more difficult for you. So he's not saying because you believe in God, your life's going to be easy. It's not what he's saying. But he is saying that the, the, the one who is righteous will endure. And that's really important. The one who is righteous, the one who clings to God's truth, will endure. How does he describe a righteous person? He says he's like a tree planted by the water. That's a righteous man. The Old Testament uses this language often when it describes a righteous person, a tree planted by the water. Look at the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 17, verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by the water that sends out, out its roots by the stream. So what is he saying? The, the one who is righteous is constantly being nourished by God's truth. It's constantly being nourished by who God is. And notice the text. It says, it's a tree 
that's constantly being nourished, and it yields its fruit in all seasons, and its leaf does not wither. In all seasons. When things are up, when things are down, when life is hard, when life is worth celebrating, he says, in all seasons, you are nourishing yourself with God's truth, And he says, and from that, you are stable like a tree planted by the water. I love kayak fishing. A a few years ago, I was kayaking on the Tar River, um, which is always really clean water. Um, But uh, I, uh, I remember seeing this tree that was planted right on the edge of the water. And I was blown away by the base of its trunk. It was massive. And I was thinking about all the different floods, all the different hurricanes we have in eastern North Carolina, and this thing is strong. It's rooted. It's grounded because it has the nourishment of this water that causes it to stand in all seasons. So look at the logical progression the psalmist says. If we walk in the confident obedience to God and his word, and we build this into the framework of our lives, if we meditate on who God is day and night, he says we're stable, we're rooted, we're strong in all seasons. And this is why the Psalms are some of the most cherished by people of all walks of life. This is why you could even remember a Psalm a day and you'll notice that your day is more grounded that you'll notice that your mind is more grounded on God's truth and what he says. And this is why the Psalms are good for coffee mugs and the cover of your Bible or just a little verse that sits over your dashboard just to remind you because they're there to ground a person. They're there to create stable beings. I love taking counsel from people. Uh, my tendency is to go to people and get my grounding, to get my truth. Sometimes my tendency is not to go to God. I've had wonderful disciples in my life. I've had people, uh, I can go back to when I became a believer. The first time I really felt seen by God, I was immediately seen by others. One of my, the beautiful parts of, of my story and, my, and God's redemption in my life I can think back to 12, 13 years old people discipling me. Um, I've had wonderful counselors in my life. I've gone to uh, biblical counselors. I've gone to psychologists that God used in my life to help me, ground me in truth. But the reality is sometimes my tendency is not to immediately go to God and his truth. And sometimes I allow other people's truth about me shape who I really am over what God says about me. And friends, I believe that so many of us, so many of us, and the reality is, even with psychology, psychology's uh, constantly changing, but the reality is mankind has yet to master how to help people deal with their pain and manage their issues pertaining to the heart. And I want godly counsel for everybody. I want everyone to have a healthy life. I mean, for me, I go to counseling because I want a healthy life and a, a healthy ministry, but We often forget psychology bows the knee to theology every single time. For you must be rooted in God's truth so you can remain stable, so that you can remain grounded. Because even at our lowest point, it will not help us to have bad theology. Bad theology will cripple us when uh, when we are suffering or we're in pain. We must know God, and we must know him rightly. What sustains us is keeping the character of God in the forefront of our mind and our hearts. From there, we are like a tree. We are grounded. We are secure. We are a tree planted by the waters. We're allowing God to nourish our souls, to nourish our hearts. And the psalmist calls this a blessed man, a blessed woman who takes counsel from God. And notice the contrast. He says in verse 4, The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, 
but the way of the wicked will perish. So here's another imagery. He says the, the righteous is like a tree um, planted by the water. The, the unrighteous, the wicked, are like chaff. What is chaff? It's, it's the grain. It's the casing of the seeds of grain. And when it's harvested, it is tossed up in the air. And what is supposed to be rooted will fall. And the chaff, the casing of the, of the grain, will be blown away. And when it lands, it does not grow. It does not produce and this is why the psalmist says the, says the wicked will not stand in judgment. I like the way the ESV says it. It says the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Meaning when the sinner, the unbeliever, stands before God, they will not have anything of substance to show for their life, which is a tragedy. We'll have nothing to show for our lives without the foundation of who God is, the foundation of the gospel. First Peter 2, or chapter 1, rather, says, verse 24, he says, all flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of grass, the grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Friend, you can live your life however you want, but the scripture says what actually remains is God's truth. And our life is of no substance if we don't stand in God's truth, according to the Psalms. And guess what? We have more revealed right now than the people who originally read these words. We have no revealed right now because we live on this side of the cross. We are now revealed God's truth through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And when we say, uh, talk about standing in the judgment, friends, we don't stand in the judgment because someone stood in the judgment for us. And his name was Jesus. Jesus stood in judgment for us. He died in our place. And now when he, because he died in our place and he resurrected from the grave, now when God sees us, he sees Jesus and what Jesus has accomplished for us. So because of that, we the, we, the wicked who were once wicked, do not stand in judgment because of what Christ has done. It's all about his righteousness. And that's what we cling to. And that becomes our hope. And that becomes the truth that constantly nourishes us. Jesus says to the woman at the well, it's drinking from a well or you will never thirst again. That's the nurturement. That's the nurturing that we need from the Lord, is reminding ourselves of God's truth. And friend, here's the reality, based upon the Psalms and based upon what we see in, throughout God's word. Upholding the truth of the gospel and allowing the truth of the gospel to be the primary voice in your life, what is foundational in your life, is not popular. It's not something that we see in our culture around us, and it's not something that's going to grow around us. Like, we're constantly going to be um, a rare thing. In fact, what you see in the New Testament, believers were called the way, because it was saying, this is not how the world is going to live. This is a small number, a small percentage of people that hold to God's truth. In fact, Jesus says it this way in Matthew 7 to his disciples. He says, verse 13, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. He says, only a few, only a few will find it. Only a few will find the way, but the but the multitudes, he says, will find the path that leads to destruction. So we shouldn't be surprised when God's truth is not popular. We shouldn't be surprised when God's truth is opposed. But it's still the well that we can drink from where we will never thirst again. And it's still worthy to put our mind and affections on. It still nourishes us. It still provides a foundation for our souls and our lives. 
So my question for you this morning is, do you have a stable foundation? Do you meditate on God's word and who he is? Where do you receive counsel? Is God's truth primary in your life? David Pallison was a Christian counselor, and he wrote tons of content from the vein of um, psychology. And in his book, he, he, a book that he wrote called Speaking the Truth in Love, Counsel in Community, he writes about his journey from once living in worldly counsel to then living in godly counsel, becoming a believer. And he shares a story about kind of both, and he's not dogging psychology or he's not even dogging uh, sec- secular counseling, but he talks about his journey and how being rooted in God's word is what's caused him to be transformed. He says, I had long despised the word of God and repressed the word of God, the, the, the God of, of that word. He says, I came to Jesus Christ because the God of scripture was merciful. He understood my motives, circumstances, thinking, behavior, emotions, and relationships better than, the psycholo- than, than all the psychologies put together. They saw only the surface of things for, the, uh, for, the, for all their uh, pretension to death. He cut to the heart. They described and treated symptoms in great detail with scholarship and genuine concern. He says, but they never um, really get the causes. He exposed causes. They misconstrued uh, what they saw most clearly and cared about most deeply. He got it right. They can never really love adequately, and they can never really uh, reorient, in, re, re, reorient their, the inner gyroscope. God is love with power. They, we, finally misled people, blind um, guides leading blind travelers in hopeful circles, whistling in the dark valley of the shadow of death, unable to escape the self-centeredness of our hearts and society, unable to find the fresh air and bright sun of a Christ-centered universe. And he says this, and I love this. Scripture took my life apart and put it back together new. The spirit of sonship began the lifelong reorientation course called Making Disciples. The God of all comfort gave truth, love, and power. Christ exposed the pretensions of the system's and methods in which I have placed my trust. Even better, Jesus gave me himself to trust and follow. David Pallison. All truth is God's truth. But we cannot miss the foundation of God's word. So friend, how are you centering your life around God's truth? Where do you find yourself taking counsel There's no word greater than the Lord's. There's no counsel that causes our hearts to be renewed and healed greater than the Lord's. There's no message more profound or more beautiful than the gospel. There's nothing greater that is worth occupying our thoughts and our minds. So friend, church, may we meditate. May we meditate on the Lord. God help us.